Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Michael Wald, and welcome back to Ask the Blood Detective. Today's show is all about sleeping. Basically, sleep or die. Now, you might think that's a bit of an exaggeration for me to have a conversation about the quality of sleep and dying, but I promise you that's no stretch of the imagination. Simply put, if you do not get the proper amount of sleep, your lifespan is shortened. And that's been proven in both animal studies and human studies. And not only will your lifespan be affected if you fail to maintain a proper sleep schedule throughout your life, but the actual quality of your living is affected as well. Now, that's common sense, right? I mean, if you don't sleep well, you might be tired the next day and you might not enjoy that day as well and you might have a little brain fog and you might not view the world as, as bright and sunny as it actually is. Uh, you might not do certain things that you would normally do if you had energy that was derived from sleep. But what I'm going to do during uh, this next hour is provide you an extremely thorough overlook of a variety of aspects of sleep, how various lifestyle factors affect sleep and other internal factors affect your sleep quality. I'll talk about the connection between eating and food timing and your sleep quality and the relationship of hormones. I'll get into the basic uh, biochemistry of sleep and I promise you that I'll go through all of these areas with one big picture in mind, and that is to teach you daily practices so that you can improve your sleep. So I've been practicing for 30 years in clinical holistic practice, and I would say that a, a, a strong 80% of my patients have sleep issues. They'll say things to me like, Dr. Wald, you know, I don't sleep very well. Um, I, I get to sleep fine. And then I wake up at three o'clock and I don't go back to sleep or I'm waking up at three o'clock and then I go back to sleep and then I wake up again and it's just a mess. Now, some of these individuals are uh, older individuals. They might be in there. What's old, right? Uh, you know, once you start hitting around uh, late 50s and forward and older, what tends to happen is the nervous system decays in various ways. And it is your nervous system that controls sleep quality. So doctors will say to some of, uh, some, some of their patients, and I've, I've heard this, and, and I don't like it, they'll say, listen, you're older now, and it's normal that older people don't sleep as much. Now, that may be true, that it is normal that older people do not sleep as much, but just because it's common and has become the new normal, does not make it okay, does not make it uh, the best physiologic thing that should be happening. I mean, it's normal that six out of 10 individuals get cancer, uh, but that's not okay. It's normal that six to 8% of cancers in the United States are caused from radiation given to you by medical procedures. My point here in giving you some other examples of new normals that, well, frankly suck, uh, is because uh, we are becoming complacent, at least in the healthcare industry. And I believe, I noticed in my practice, probably around a decade or so ago, that I was not giving the proper attention to improvement of sleep quality in my patients. I would review their health history, we would talk about sleep, and I might give them some basic suggestions about improving their sleep, but improper sleep is so fundamental for health that it cannot be understated. Sometimes you can take a pill like melatonin, L-tryptophan, or gamma amino butyric acid. Heck, you could drink some warm milk and it might do the trick for you, but most people will not respond to those uh, attempts with any reliability. And the reason for that, I believe, is because Sleep problems or poor sleep hygiene, as it's called in medicine, can have a multitude of factors. And each person may be exposed to or 
is experiencing a variety of these factors in their lifestyle that are messing with their sleep quality. Now, for a physician to say, well, it's normal that when you're older, you don't, you know, you don't sleep well, is not scientific at all. It is merely based on their experience and what they're told at other seminars, because I've been to the seminars. Oh, yeah, yeah, older people don't sleep well. Next. Well, maybe they don't sleep well because they're, uh, they have anxiety. Maybe they don't sleep well because they're depressed. Maybe they're not sleeping well because they're not eating well. They may be protein deficient. They do not therefore make neurotransmitters which are required and made from proteins in their brains so that their circadian rhythms, which is the sleep cycle, is working well. Now that's just a few examples. There are hormonal examples of problems that create sleep issues. There are toxicity issues. I mean, if you have aluminum, for example, depositing in your brainstem, that absolutely can affect your sleep, not to mention give you Alzheimer's dementia. Chronic inflammatory causes, many different types of inflammation, cause a hyperexcitability of the brain and nervous system, which is the exact opposite of what you want when you are trying to have quality sleep. So for those of you just joining us, thank you. My name is Dr. Michael Wald, and I have a practice located in Katona, New York. I'm located an hour north of New York City, and I uh, work with patients face-to-face, -face, obviously, and also by distance over the phone. So if you want to contact me with a story idea or to work with me, call me at 914-552-1442. That's 914 552 one four four two, and please uh, also check out the other blogs that I have and my podcasts, which you'll see under the blog section of my website. The website is i n t m e d n y dot com, or you can just Google uh, Doctor Michael Wald. The website will come up. Okay, so let's get into the uh, the nitty gritty first. What does eating have to do with sleep? Well, ultimately, to maintain what's known as a normal sleep rhythm, you need to maintain a normal eating rhythm. So part of the reason for this linking of eating and sleeping is the body's cortisol rhythm. So let's back up. Cortisol, as you know, is an adrenal hormone. It is considered a stress hormone. It has many essential effects in the, in the human body. We cannot live without it. And you probably heard about it when we think about weight loss. People with high cortisol or hypercortisolism may have uh, belly fat. Um, that sometimes happens. There's a lot of people, there's even more people I would say that have belly fat that do not have uh, high cortisol that do. So we have to be careful to not generalize what we see on television commercials, but we're talking about sleeping. So let's talk about cortisol or what's known as the cortisol rhythm and better sleep. So as I just mentioned, cortisol is a hormone produced by the adrenal glands that are located above each of your kidneys. So you actually have two uh, adrenal glands. And cortisol helps regulate, uh, I mean, many, many different uh, body functions, including uh, the activation of thyroid hormone, uh, bone resorption, which is a term that means keeping your bones strong, muscle strength is enhanced by cortisol, energy production, uh, resistance to infection, even resistance to cancer. The higher your cortisol, the increase your risk of all cause morbidity and mortality, including cancer. But listen to what I'm going to tell you now, because it's almost never talked about or distinguished. Many of you get saliva hormone tests. So congratulations, you've wasted your money. Why? Because if you have a sense that you have high cortisol, you have all the symptoms of it, those that I've mentioned, plus there's lots more. Basically, it feels like adrenal fatigue, you know, when, when someone uh, believes they may have high cortisol. But what happens is during a stress response, the stress of disease, the stress of infection, the stress of too much exercise, the stress of lack of exercise, the stress of aging, the stress of abnormal aging, the stress of inflammation, the stress of toxicity, the stress of nutritional deficiencies, the stress of repair, your cortisol levels can go up. 
because it's a stress hormone. It's supposed to help you compensate. But if the stressor remains too long, then you know what the adrenal glands do? They, they just fizzle out. They cannot produce the normal cortisol. So your normal cortisol or your cortisol goes down. It can go down to normal or down to lower than normal. And it can even go to low. So low, low normal, or even normal. So here's the important point. You can have all the signs of high cortisol, but your blood work or your saliva testing, which is the common test for cortisol, might simply show that, that it looks normal because you're looking at it on a test after it tanked and went down from being high so long. So the practitioner says to you, well, I don't really understand why it looks normal because you have all the symptoms. It looks normal because it was high and now it's not. And here's the next caveat, very important. If you can get this one also, in my estimation, of, because I'm a lab teacher, I teach laboratory to doctors. I wrote a 500 page text on this. If you have, let's first restate the first part. If you have hyperadrenal stress, your cortisol can be high. You could still have hyperadrenal stress symptoms, but your cortisol could tank, become deficient because it was high too long. The body just can't make any more and the test looks fine or the test can look low. So you can have the signs of hyper, but your test can show low. So what do you do with this stuff? Here's what you do with it. If you have a sense that you need adrenal support, high or low, then get the proper adrenal support. Don't waste your money on these tests that are not accurate. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the right adrenal support? Well, the right adrenal support is the following. And remember, we're talking about adrenal support because if you do not have proper adrenal support, you don't have proper anything support in your body because if your adrenals are weak, if they're overworked, everything else suffers to different extents, including your sleep patterns. Now, some herbalists have said to me, oh, Dr. Wall, the best herbs for kicking up the adrenals are, you know, and they'll say echinacea or astragalus or a few others, uh, licorice. And I'll say, well, if the patient, if the patient's needs overall say that those are the appropriate herbs, then I agree with you. But if the patient's needs overall do not suggest that those particular herbs are the best herbs, then they're not the best herbs. Someone might get the best adrenal balance from buffered vitamin C or coffee. Coffee's not evil, it's an herb. So my mantra as your blood detective host, okay? And remember, you're your personal blood detectives. That's the whole point in the show, that you get to think more deeply than others to make better healthcare choices. Because if you're not making better healthcare choices, you're going to end up as sick and diseased as most others. Even most others that know something about natural healthcare. The level to which I'm going to have you think on these shows is a few levels deeper to make these distinctions like the ones I just made. All right, so we said that cortisol helps to regulate all sorts of body functions, thyroid hormone, bone density, muscle strength, uh, energy production, resistance to disease because of immune improvements, and, and also autoimmune disease. If your adrenal glands are disturbed and your cortisol rhythm, which you need for sleep is disturbed, you have an increased risk also for autoimmune diseases. Even, the, uh, even allergic reactions, your, the intensity of an allergic reaction can be much higher if you're sleep deprived. So cortisol is a strong determinant in how rejuvenating sleep will be. If your cortisol is not within a reasonable range, you will not have what's known as restorative sleep. You can have a lot of sleep, but it's not a, ma a, matter, a matter of the, the amount. It is a matter of the quality of it. And that's called restorative sleep. So if you're waking up in the morning and you're still tired and you slept nine hours or 10 hours or 12 hours, that's non-restorative. That means your cortisol rhythm is off. And that may or may not show up on a saliva test or any other test, but it's just true because that's what causes that. So I've mentioned the word 
circadian rhythms a few times. I just want to spend one minute on that because I mentioned it to a patient yesterday, and these were two um, older ladies in their 80s, and they had never heard of it in their entire lives. So sometimes I realize that I live in a bubble (laughs) when I'm talking about certain things. So a circadian rhythm basically is a rhythm in your nervous system that controls uh, the the sleep cycle. That's really all you need to know. Okay, so cortisol is produced in a cyclic fashion and the highest amount of it is released in the morning and the lowest amount at night. So if you have a high amount at night, you're not going to sleep. So this 24 hour cycle is the circadian rhythm and an abnormal circadian rhythm of adrenal hormones absolutely adversely affects multiple critical functions in the body, including how your cells produce energy and how your immune system works. So basically folks, don't get thrown off by the whole circadian rhythm, cortisol rhythm sleep cycle. We're talking right now about If you don't sleep well, everything breaks down. And you know that's true of the adrenal glands, right? If you don't have strong adrenal glands, everything breaks down. If you don't have a strong thyroid gland, everything breaks down. If you don't have a strong immune system, everything breaks down. That's all true, right? Of course. But all of those things depend on sleep. Um, And it's a two-way flow. All right. So the 24-hour cycle, the circadian cortisol cycle, when abnormal, throws off the adrenal hormones and can screw up any other functions in your body. Any disruption at all in a circadian rhythm results in a tendency towards everything from fatigue, um, even easy bruising because of the other biochemical aspects of what changes when the sleep cycle is off. Infections can cause uh, an increased risk of infections, absolutely is known to happen when someone is sleep deprived, even infertility, osteoporosis, a low sex drive, infertility, adult acne even, um, abdominal bloating, migraines, or your blood pressure, which is also controlled by your nervous system, which includes the circadian cycles. So any disruption in the cortisol level during the night will affect the quality of your sleep. So if the cortisol level is high during the night, and you're an individual who has disrupted REM sleep, which is REM sleep, you will wake up non-refreshed no matter how many hours of sleep you have. And that's what I call the the non-restorative sleep. So REM sleep is the stage of sleep during which you have dreams. You're dreaming. And the REM sleep is accompanied by Um, an increase in the breathing rate, but it's more regular, and also muscle relaxation. And the intense dreaming part that occurs during REM sleep is the result of what's known as heightened cerebral activity. So the cerebral part of your brain is just working more. Now, the paralysis that occurs simultaneously in the majority of all the voluntary muscle groups, they just stop, stop moving. You know, muscles of the chin and the neck, that's thought to be a way to keep your body from acting out the dreams that occur during this very intense cerebral stage. But all I really need you to understand there is that certain things turn on during proper REM sleep and certain things turn off. Now, REM sleep, that's disturbed sleep, okay? Disturbed REM sleep may be one of the reasons that you or others have a full eight hours or of rest and, and nonetheless wake up very exhausted. So again, if you're getting tons of hours and you are not feeling restorative, then you know you have this disruption in the circadian rhythm. So the key to rejuvenating sleep is having a normal cortisol at night. The key to normal cortisol at night is having a normal cortisol rhythm during the day. So how do you do that? Well, let's talk about the glycemic food index and cortisol levels because they are related. What you need to know is that cortisol levels are rapidly responsive to what you eat during the day. And there is the glycemic index of a meal and it affects the cortisol level for several hours, three, four, five hours, depending on the food. So before I continue with the glycemic index, 
My name is Dr. Michael Wald. You're listening to Ask the Blood Detective. We're talking about sleep and death, basically. The importance of sleep or lack thereof that underlies a bunch of degenerative effects in human beings, which is basically everything. You know, sleep is one of those things like, like water and, and oxygen and food uh, and sex, maybe, for some of us. So these are things that we just, we have to have, otherwise we're dying. Now, I just mentioned the glycemic index. So the glycemic index of a food reflects how our blood sugar level is affected by a particular food. So foods containing high sugar and low fiber have a high glycemic index sometimes and result in much wider fluctuations in insulin levels than foods with a low glycemic index. So basically foods that screw up your blood sugar have a higher insulin association with them and they're called high glycemic index foods. And as you might guess, they screw up your normal REM sleep and your high quality sleep and your circadian rhythms. But the glycemic index, everyone, it's not 100% true. I have tested patients where I gave them what was considered a high glycemic food, a food that's supposed to cause a rapid increase and dramatic increase in blood sugar, and it didn't do anything. And then I gave them something like steak that was um, supposed to lower their blood sugar, and it didn't do that at all. So like everything else in healthcare, uh, natural medicine, we have to find out what's true for you. The only way to do that is to test you. But I'm going to speak about the glycemic index as, as if it's true, just so you get the points. So foods containing, as I said, high sugar and low fiber, they have a high glycemic index, They'll cause wild fluctuation in insulin. So insulin, yet, is another hormone affected with sleep. We talked about the adrenals. The adrenals talks to the thyroid. And now here we are, insulin, which is in the pancreas. High insulin levels have been found to be a, a real um, underlying uh, influence or a culprit, really, in a lot of diseases. Everything from coronary artery disease to hypertension and metabolic syndrome and hyperlipidemia. It's bad, bad stuff. So high glycemic foods such as sugar, refined starches, they will tend to cause cortisol levels to rise. You may or may not see it on a test though, because a test is only looking at it at one point in time. You would have to have several cortisol tests to see a change, and you may never see that change, but your body still may be having those cortisol changes, but you're just not testing it right. Sometimes in healthcare, you just have to assume certain things. I don't like checking cortisol levels because they're almost never normal. And when they, or I should say abnormal. And if they are, um, let's say normal, and I don't agree with them, then I'd ignore it. I treat the patient based on their symptoms and my 30 years of experience. And if the patient's labs, the cortisols uh, look um, abnormal, then I say, oh, okay, fine. Well, I was going to assume that anyway, we should have saved the money on the test. Okay, you always want to ask your practitioners, do you really need a test? Can't you guess? Isn't this like self-evident? You know, and if they say no, it's not self-evident, then you need to know why. And if you don't understand their reason or the response to you, then you have to do some research. Okay, so high glycemic index foods, I mentioned refined sugar, starches and sugars, they will cause the the cortisol levels generally to rise. So for individuals who start the day with a normal cortisol level, starchy or sugary breakfast food choices can cause cortisol levels to get very high out of the normal range. And and when when you eat that way in the morning, the cortisol will likely remain elevated throughout most of the day, even all night, particularly if you continue to eat badly throughout the day. Certain interventions like herbs or supplements might help lower the cortisol level, but not out of context with fixing the diet. So worse than having a high glycemic meal is having no meal, according to some. So just hear me out. Any time during the day that one does not eat within five hours of the previous meal or snack, the cortisol level increases. Why? Because it thinks you're under stress. Uh, and the cortisol helps maintain the body uh, sort of like a backup to glucose. So a rise above the normal range during the day, almost always, of cortisol we're talking about, guarantees that the nighttime cortisol will be high and disrupt the REM sleep. 
a single late meal or skipped meal or high glycemic meal during the day can and often results in high hypercortisolism or high cortisol during the day and part of the night. So a cortisol level higher than it should be during the night results in a disruption of the REM sleep and you will have non-restorative sleep. Now, forget food for a second. Anxiety and stress and, and depression, that can also cause high cortisol. So it's very important to look at each person, like I do, to determine which factors, how many factors that they have playing upon their cortisol. A toxin can raise cortisol. Um, thyroid problems can raise cortisol. Anterior pituitary hormone problems can affect cortisol. Chronic inflammation can affect cortisol, not just food. Okay? So low glycemic foods such as eggs, meat, fish, poultry, most vegetables tend to lower cortisol. So low glycemic foods tend to lower, high glycemic foods tend to higher cortisol. So if, if you start with a normal morning cortisol, eating foods with a low glycemic index category every five hours during the day, that's going to help keep your cortisol on track. Now, the high glycemic index of sugar and starch, including whole grains, they're going to require consumption of nearly an equal weight of animal protein to maintain a glycemic balance. So even though you might be eating high glycemic foods, if you have the proper animal proteins and healthy fats, by the way, you might be able to balance things out. Now, vegetables usually balance themselves in terms of glycemic index but vegetables are not of sufficiently low uh, glycemic index to balance grains, at least not the grains uh, as they are routinely prepared by most Americans. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that if you're eating sugary and starchy foods in the morning, if you have an animal protein or a plant protein, that might help maintain a glycemic balance. But if you have high glycemic foods in the morning and you think vegetables might help you maintain a normal glycemic balance in spite of the high sugar foods in the morning, it might not work out that way. It should work out because these vegetables are broken down, they're low glycemic, uh, they're high in fiber and water, but there's just a different chemistry. For some people, they will work uh, for balancing out your cortisol throughout the day, even if you eat badly for breakfast, but not as reliably as proteins, I suppose is what I'm saying, okay? So, the, you know, there's many cultures around the world that have developed uh, this process of uh, pan frying and soaking and steaming rice that um, lowers the glycemic index of a non-gluten grain. All right, that's just a side note there. So everything from pan frying breaks down certain elements of uh, rice, soaking will do that, steaming will do that. And it helps to lower the glycemic index of uh, a gluten, the non-gluten grain rice. Now, if you want to prevent the uh, deleterious upward swings of cortisol, again, what we call hypercortisolism, you're usually going to do better to prevent, or should, I should say to balance all sugars and grain, including whole grains in your diet with animal protein or uh, very dense uh, plant-based proteins like beans, okay? nuts and seeds, things like that. But if you have a real sugar problem and a, a very strong sleep issue, then you might need supplementation of, of vegetable proteins if you want to be vegan. So even given what we know about the various uh, pitfalls of, of animal protein, it probably remains better to eat animal protein with each meal uh, at which you have sugar, including fruit uh, or grains. But as a vegan myself, I don't eat animal proteins. So I take a uh, rice and pea-based protein powder and I will eat that with my sugary foods or drink that. So if animal protein is not tolerated, maybe you can't digest it or for medical reasons, religious reasons or social, you know, social conscientious reasons, you don't want it. Uh, remain vegan. Um, it's probably better to remain vegan than to be carbo-vegan, okay? I did do a show, which you can look up on um, diets. Uh, you'll find that on my blog at my website at intmedny.com. That's intmedny. 
ny.com. So now let's talk about pain. And how does, how does pain screw with cortisol balance? Well, some of you might have a clue. So pain, even as simple as a headache, can, can elevate your cortisol. You stub your toe, your cortisol is going up. Pain and the elevated cortisol both contribute to sleep disruption. So dietary factors alone, they're seldom fully adequate to overcome the disruption of cortisol caused by pain. So if your cortisol is high and you're cleaning up your diet and your diet's fantastic, but you haven't resolved your pain situation, you're probably not going to sleep better. And this is important. So a lot of people have chronic discomfort. So when I say pain, I don't mean you're screaming out, help me, I've got pain. You just might have like a chronic like shoulder ache. But your nervous system is aware of that and it responds to it in a stressful way by increasing cortisol. Or maybe it's increased cortisol so much that your cortisol just takes a dive, like we said earlier. So pain management and correction of any underlying cause of pain is primary. So I will use other chiropractic adjustments. I can use a very uh, rare and amazing electrotherapy known as synaptic therapy. Almost no one has it because it's expensive to buy the machine. It's not expensive to receive it. Is that synaptic therapy teaches your nervous system how to make more natural anti-cortisol uh, painkillers pain and anti-inflammatories, endorphins, encephalins, and serotonin. And the machine has you manipulate the, the power on the machine. So you literally are doing it based on your tolerance. And by I say you doing it, you manipulating the power on the machine, that's your brain doing that. So your brain is teaching your brain how to make more natural anti-inflammatory cortisol-lowering painkillers. So that's synaptic therapy. It's not like TENS machines, T-E-N-S, trans electrical nerve stimulators, or those machines that some chiropractors or physical therapists have. This is, those are toys compared to synaptic therapy for chronic pain. There's even studies that show that synaptic therapy increases the speed of, of a uh, slow white blood cells, which is a big deal. Okay, now listen, a single skip meal or a high starch or sugar loading meal is enough to throw off the cortisol rhythm for the upcoming night and makes it less likely that the next day will start off with a normal cortisol rhythm. We've established that. We've also talked about the glucose index or glycemic index and its effect upon your circadian rhythm. And then we talked about pain. Now let's talk about emotions a little bit. Emotions as a contributor to aging hormones, okay? So emotions that arise out of feeling threatened or feeling any sense of lack of control tend to be associated with the release of specific stress hormones. Most notably, you guessed it, cortisol, fear, anger, frustration, sadness, they all have the potential of increasing cortisol and reducing the sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. So emotions, boy, that's a, that's a big area when it comes to sleep because sleep is controlled by the brain and our thoughts, feelings, and emotions are working their way around our brains. That's where they live in a sense. But those of us that are holistic know that our thoughts don't merely exist in our heads. Our fears, our emotions, our anguish, our sufferings, they don't merely exist in our, in our cranium. They're manifested in direct and, and uh, indirect ways throughout our entire bodies. So if you have a stressful thought in your head, your adrenal glands will produce cortisol, which is in another part of your body. And that cortisol may promote inflammation, which attacks anything anywhere in your body. So I hope, suffice it to say for the moment, that stress in the head will almost certainly affect sleep quality. Sometimes I visit with people who are interested in using nutrition to affect, let's say, their anxieties, their depression, uh, even their bipolar, um, borderline personality disorder, 
Uh, and nutrition does have more or less a role in those and a variety of other uh, mental emotional conditions that are associated with sleep difficulties or not. My point in mentioning them is that there is no nutritional supplement or dietary um, substitute for proper uh, and correctly managed mental health care. Uh, there's a lot to be said about talking things through and developing coping mechanisms, for example, and to uh, you know, look back at one's life and reflect upon uh, behaviors and that sort of thing. It, of course, goes beyond the scope of this show to go into any sort of uh, reasonable uh, way in which to approach someone's uh, psychological concerns that may be affecting their sleep. But if one does manage their psychological concerns with, let's say, good mental health counseling and complements that with the appropriate dietary and other lifestyle um, factors such as proper exercise and the use of uh, nutritional supplements. I will be doing a show uh, at some point in the, uh, in the next three or four weeks known as uh, Mental and Elemental Nutrition for the Brain and the Mind, where I do talk in great detail about the use of, of supplementation in mental health disorders but many people with outright mental health disorders, and then the rest of us, which might actually have mental disorders and don't know it, but uh, that we have sleep problems that may be associated with anxiety and depression, and we don't even know that we have those things. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to get super practical and review with you quite a number of bullet points that are, I think, the things to understand about improving what's known as sleep hygiene. So I love that word because it, it reminds me that, or I, I get this image in my brain that when I go to bed, I, I might want to take a bath in my bed, you know, because it's hygiene. I should be washing myself, but that's not what it means, okay? <laughs> sleep hygiene means, as you might imagine, cleaning up things such that uh, you can sleep better. So what are those things? Okay, first of all, and some of this may sound like, um, a repeat of a few other items. So, but I feel that the the reinforcement is needed. So, we want to identify stressors that that basically clog our mind. We want to resolve whatever issues, uh, negative thoughts before bedtime. How do you do that? Well, again, we can. I can only give you very very short suggestions here in in the remaining time. But uh, one technique that I've suggested to my patients that they have said works well is to simply write down stressful thoughts, get them out of your head and onto a piece of paper, sometimes just distinguishing those out, that's it, could, could make you uh, sleep better, just that alone. You want to also maybe consider, you want to trust that things will work out. Also, realizing though, um, certain things maybe are out of your control and they may not work out the way that you want. And to think logically that you, any effort that you spend on something you cannot control is wasted effort and only stressful and will make your sleep issues worse. I mean, it's nice to just say to someone, hey, don't worry, it'll work out, or it'll work out. It might not. It might not work out the way you want. I suppose I should give a little disclaimer here and say that this information I'm talking about in terms of mental health, in terms of sleep, this is all for your education, obviously. This is not for you to run out and try everything here. Um, you might take these, po these points to your nutritional practitioners, to your regular doctors, to your therapists, and talk them through. That would be wonderful. And that's what this information is meant to, to be used for. I would use it, uh, and I'm mindful of it. I wrote all of this, this information so that I can figure out what each individual needs so we can just get down to those things. But because I don't know you, I'm giving you a little bit more with the instruction that this is for your education. And if these, these points don't resolve your concerns, uh, you certainly would want to see a qualified healthcare professional. You know, reminding yourself, getting back to clearing your mind before bed, which might be keeping you up, is to 
you know, realize that tomorrow's a new day. It's, it's a fresh start. And what happened yesterday does not have to control what happens to you on a new day. Focusing your mind elsewhere. This is something that I actually practice a lot. When I feel overly focused and distressed on a point and it's affecting my sleep, I try to think of something else. Um, I would suggest not thinking too much about falling asleep if you're having problems falling asleep. Try to clear your head and think about sleep as little as possible. Allow your thoughts to drift to things that are positive and relaxing. Now, one of the ways of doing that might be you might want to put on some music that you like and you want to sit in a chair outside of your bedroom because anything that you do other than sleeping in your bedroom is likely going to disrupt your sleep patterns, including watching TV. I like listening to music that has no words, so I don't get more of my brain involved in words and interpreting and I might start to go off in other places. So that's an important point. I would find an activity to relax the mind and your body like doing light stretching. Light stretching is a very, very nice way to put your body in a different relaxed state and your mind. Unless, of course, you hate stretching, then that would be a problem. <laughs> but true, right? I, uh, as a runner, I uh, would run for years and years because I thought it was a healthy thing to do. And I really didn't like it. And um, one day I was running on a beautiful trail. And all of a sudden as I'm running, these two deer just run across the path very, very close to me. And it shocked me. And then I thought to myself, I walked for a few steps and I thought, how lucky am I to be able to run in this place to experience what I just experienced? And then from that point forward, I, I honestly loved running and I still do. So if you can, if you can love what it is you're doing, then that obviously makes it a whole lot easier. You might practice deep breathing, something like, 10 deep, slow, calm breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth with your eyes closed. You might repeat that three or four times, maybe five or six or 10 times before bed. I mentioned listening to calming music, nature sounds. I love nature sounds. I have an app on my phone. I can listen to like 10 different types of you know, rainfall and flowing streams and wind and bird sounds and ocean. It's just, it's amazing what you can do with today's technologies. And I absolutely love it. And sometimes I just find myself uh, in another place. Uh, I might be lying on a beach and listening to the ocean waves on my phone. Before I know it, I'm asleep. For some people, uh, classical music that's slow and soothing is very useful. You know, control the volume. It should be should be background sound. That's that's what you want of it. Background sound. Also, very important, essential. You need to try to establish what I call a pre bedtime pattern or ritual. So, going to sleep at the same time every night. You're going to teach your circadian rhythms to activate at specific times. You want to wake up at the same time every morning. Have a cup of hot tea. Take a warm bath. You want to do these things repeatedly at the same times in the same order because this teaches your nervous system to function a different way other than the way that was keeping you awake, one that tends to promote sleep. Reading is okay, as long as it's not a murder mystery, you, you know what I'm saying? So you need to choose something that works for reading. As I mentioned earlier, use your bed for sleeping only. Activities such as uh, you know reading and writing and watching TV should be done on the couch or in a chair anywhere apart from where you sleep. And you know in that way, your body associates your bed with sleep and rest only. 
so important. Someone said to me, Dr. Old, but I only watch TV for a couple of minutes. It's not going to do it. All right? Some activities to avoid prior to sleep. Do not have large amounts of fluids or a big meal three to four hours prior to sleep. That has a tendency to disrupt your cortisol levels and therefore disrupt your sleep. No caffeinated beverages such as soda or caffeinated tea or coffee. Drink uh, chamomile or sleepy time type teas instead. You might want to exercise earlier in the day or with less intensity. Exercising, although extremely beneficial in, in tiring the body for some people, if, if done before bed, can give you a boost of energy, making it hard to fall asleep afterwards. Now, I work out pretty much every day, between one and two hours of hard weights. And I, go, I get right to sleep. So, so for me, that's not working. Okay? So exercising earlier in the day with less intensity for some of you might work. For others may not. You have to experiment. And you have to give it, you know, a couple of weeks of experimentation. You know, a person will say to me, Dr. Wald, you know, I, I tried that melatonin and it didn't work. I'm like, well, how long did you try it for? Three days. Um, that's not enough time. How long should I try it for? Six weeks. And given their weight, they need a certain dose. And maybe they need that with a certain nutritional partner. So when it comes to the exercise and the timing, uh, you might want to do that over three or four weeks so your body can show you what it can do or setting up that bedtime routine. So you need th three, four, five, six weeks of trying different things. It's very surprising to me how little time people give change um, uh, to take hold. Okay, some people, they'll change very quickly, but most of us will not. So do a type of exercise during the day that um, is healthy for you. And probably I would have to say yes, most people are better off doing exercise earlier in the day away from sleep. I'm an exception. Aerobic exercise, that'll tire your muscles. You'll need rest to recover. That's a good one earlier in the day. Unless you feel that that amount of exercise is going to affect you adversely at work. A lot of people get energized from exercise. If you're not getting energized from exercise, I actually think there's probably something wrong with your chemistry. Um, and exercise should be done at, at earlier in the day. But if, if you're too beat up from it, then I think your adrenals would be weak. And we'd have to look into that. The next point, go to bed with a positive attitude. You'll awake the next morning feeling positive and refreshed. Generally speaking, you will. And um, what I do when I wake up is I just thank, you know, the universe for having me woke, wake up another day. And um, I always have something planned to do that's, that's fun every day. Every single day. Don't lay in bed for more than 20 minutes, by the way, uh, at night. So if 20 minutes goes by and you're still not asleep in your bed at night, you need to get up, you need to walk around, you need to sit elsewhere and read, write, listen to music, listen to ocean sounds, do something else. But if you stay in that bed longer than 20 minutes, you're teaching your body to be awake in the bed. It's all what is called neuroplasticity. Now I've used that term before in a number of my shows, like my brain show. Uh, and it basically means how to change the structure of your brain in a positive way. And if you stay in bed for more than 20 minutes, you are changing your neuroplasticity, yes, but not in a positive way. Do a calming activity before bed. Don't overstimulate your mind. Read about topics that are positive. Definitely, as I said earlier, don't read horror movies or upsetting stories. Listen to calm, soothing music. Also, you want to be mindful of your breathing. In fact, breathing is one of the best ways to get your stress response back online. So what's a stress response? A stress response, which all mammals have, involves the following. So early hominids, early human beings, right? They had, they had a lot of uh, dangers in their environment. And when they would be weary of dangers, let's say they, they smell or heard uh, an elephant, 
or a saber tooth or whatever. I'm not sure if saber tooths were around when human beings were, probably not. But my point is, when they were aware of a stressor, the cortisol levels went up, the heart rate went up, the muscles tightened, the reaction time tightened, um, and they run. Now, if they don't physically run, they still have a stress response doing what it's doing. If they wait around a couple of minutes and say, you know, the, uh, we're not in danger anymore, that stress response and the high cortisol and all those physiological reactions, it starts to go back to baseline or near baseline. Now, in our time today, we've screwed everything up. We, many of us, right now, sitting listening to the show, are in a stress response with high cortisol levels and increased blood pressure and things that are consistent with your body feeling that there is a danger around. And that is that is okay in the short term. But if the danger is really not there, then the stress response needs to stop. If the stress response does not stop, it's like a car that you've got on full throttle and after a while going at 200 miles an hour, it's gonna start throwing off pieces. So you need to calm that down and then need to slow down. Otherwise, it goes down a hill and that's called the exhaustion phase of the stress response. There's the alarm reaction where we say, oh no, and then there is this compensation phase where we're dealing with the stress, but if the stress doesn't stop, boom, we go through that depressed phase and, and that, is, that is what really messes with your health. So you don't wanna have your mind stimulated at night. What you wanna do is notice your breathing. Your breathing is directly connected to your autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system does automatic things like involved in the stress response. So if you do nothing more than just slow your breathing, slow your movements, slow your talking, you will provide feedback to your nervous system that there's no alarm reaction. And your nervous system will start to calm all those physiologic reactions that are not conducive to sleep start to fade away. This may take you several times of experimentation and practice before it's actually working for you, but it will work. It's one of those very important things. So be mindful of your breathing. Pretend you're sleeping so you can develop a deep breathing pattern. That's been very effective for me. And if you train your mind to think you're sleeping, your body will actually respond. Yeah, I was just gonna say, well, here I am saying it. If I, if I don't wanna answer my wife, I'll pretend I'm asleep and I'm, I'm right to sleep. But I, I never do that, of course. Now, you also wanna stay hydrated. Dehydration can cause insomnia. And then well, lots of individuals will resort to Benadryl and z and things of that nature. I'm, I'm not big fans of those. I like to use GABA, which is called gamma aminobutyric acid. It's a relaxing neurotransmitter. I base the dose on um, the metabolic rate of the patient, or I usually give them at least two to four of the pills based on my strength in my GABA product, which you can see on my blood detective website under the supplement section. I'll almost always combine the GABA with melatonin, a minimum of three milligrams. If you're more than 10 pounds overweight, it might be as much as six, it might be as much as nine, which gets us also into an anti-cancer dose of melatonin. As I mentioned earlier, I don't find that melatonin usually works to get people to sleep. A few people it will work. Most people, when I say, so how's the melatonin working? And they were taking it, they're like, it doesn't work. But if you combine it with the GABA, it can work very well. And then I'll combine it with my CBD oil, my CBD oil is known as phytocannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, uh, because I have mine formulated to stimulate the cannabinoid receptors. And then lastly, I would add tryptophan. And depending again on your health issues and other problems and medications, I would use a combination of tryptophan, CBD oil, melatonin, GABA, that sleepy time tea. All of these things are non-habit forming. You want to take the melatonin and the GABA and the tryptophan about 30 minutes before uh, bedtime. Uh, and the same thing actually about the CBD oil. And I'll have a person take CBD oil, a dropper of it in the morning, sometime midday, and then at night along with the GABA, melatonin, and tryptophan. And it really has a nice effect of calming down the high cortisol during the day. Okay? So what we've done today is we reviewed how lack of sleep is 
uh, and does affect our morbidity and mortality. It will affect all the diseases and our susceptibilities to them, including the autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular disease, high blood sugar pressure, fats, cancer, you name it. None of it escapes. Poor sleep, poor immune, immune system, poor healing, you've opened her up to a can of worms, of worms. But proper sleep will do just the opposite. It's not a panacea, but it is a fundamental aspect of having proper health. Supplementation, looking at glycemic foods, based on what foods you might need for your health problems, and adjusting your lifestyle to the right exercises. Now, everyone has a different need for different types of exercises, and most people that I speak to have no idea what exercise actually is, but once I help them figure that out, you've got a plan here that is a lifestyle plan that includes proper sleep, as fundamental to that plan. So if you have any comments on this radio show, I want to hear them. Please send them to me at info at blooddetective.com. That's info at blooddetective.com. Also on my homepage, you can just click into, uh, you'll see the different portals on the front to get me a message. And the website is intmedny.com. My phone number if you want to talk to me. Uh, maybe see me as a patient at a distance or in person is 914-552-1442. Thank you so much again for joining me and I'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye.